Welcome to Clean Radio, helping to navigate the journey of recovery by removing the stigma and offering a choice for a new life. With your host, Pat O'Brien. Radio and television personality. We know him from the World Series of Super Bowl, NBA Finals, Final Four, U.S. Open. A legend. And distinguished clinical expert, Andrew Spanswick. Andrew Spanswick is with me, and there's a reason, because he knows everything and I don't. I'm Robert Shapiro. I'm Jack Osborne. You're listening to Clean Radio. I think you're pretty cool, Andrew. Thank yeah, you. Thank I like you, your Jack. vibes. And, All right. and, Listen, if I was getting loaded, I totally would come to your treatment center. Clean Radio is presented in part by Pure Simple Juice. Taste the best of what nature has to offer. PureSimpleJuice.com Addiction is in your backyard. You can join the conversation right now. You are looking live. Here we are in Portland as advertised. Hi, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien. Welcome to Clean Radio. Here we are with the studio audience, and you're all looking good out there. And Andrew Spanzuk is here. Great to be back in Portland. A lot of old friends here. Yeah. Hey, Pat. How are you doing? It's a nice sunny day. It's a little hot, actually. It's been hot. They had the big parade yesterday, which literally is the longest parade ever here in the Rose City. And you made friends with every policeman in town. Well, they all know me, but not for the reasons that you might think out there. (laughs) Because I used to do all the Portland games up here uh, back when... They were really good. Now they're just good. Uh, but uh, it was great to be here. A lot of old friends here. And, and just a lot of activity going on in Portland. As I said, last time we were here, it was snowing almost. It was raining. It was it really fr- yeah, it was cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how was your week? Did you have a good week? Well, no, I've been with you all week. I know how your week no, was. No, yeah, no, my week was good. And, uh, you know, it's good to be up here in Portland and uh, get out of L.A. for a little while. And uh, definitely interesting to see everybody that we uh, work with up here. This is, is Clean Radio. We're on all up and down the, the coast here on the western part of the United States. We're on in New York City. The Mets continue to, uh, they played today, but uh, they go up and down. They started out great, and then they're kind of uh, settling in. A couple injuries here. And they're on WOR in New York, 710. If the Mets go south... Uh, you call Berman's show and tell him Pat O'Brien said the call. And uh, they win what's, it's our, it's all what's our going on? We take credit for all the victories. Yeah. Cleanradio.com is our uh, where you find us, facebook.com slash cleanradio. I'm at POB Pat O'Brien, and you are, Andrew is at Clean CEO. Right, the best Twitter name ever. How would anybody know Clean. that's you? <laughs> Clean with a K. Oh, so right away they know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but so join us uh, today and uh, tell your friends. Sarah Gilbert's going to join us later and have a little social media uh, conversation, what's going on out there. And uh, we have a guest tonight. We have a couple of guests tonight. In fact, we have a good show tonight. Uh, Randy Spilling is here. Hi, Randy. How are you? Hi, Pat. How are you doing? Growing a beard. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Randy. <laughs> so I shaved everything off and you're starting a beard. What's going on here? Yes. You guys just, inversed. Just, <laughs> you beard inversed. I feel like I had to fit into Portland and embrace it, you know? <laughs> Growing a beard. It looks and good on you. I look really young if I don't have any facial hair. You'll so want to look young. Just trying someday, to look older, wiser. <laughs> We're all I was from... I was tattooing them in the green room. Uh, let's That's not great. get into that right okay. now. Both, <laughs> both of you need help. Um, uh, so we're gonna talk about a lot of things tonight. A disturbing story, uh, to start with from Philadelphia. Anthony Riley, who was one of the best first time singers on The Voice. He was the first singer that every chair, the voice works when you come out and you sing. Uh, Blake Shelton and Christina Aguilera and, and Pharrell, all these guys, they turn around, they want to coach you. And uh, he was the first guy, he had the record for all four ch- chairs turning, and he was fantastic. He committed suicide last night, uh, but he had the triple problem. He had instant success, yep. an addiction problem, and probably some mental problems. Yeah, it's a tragic story, and obviously uh, he couldn't handle it. He dropped out of the show, told them he had a substance abuse program, and they found him dead in his basement. Um, so, yeah. But that's a triple, right? With with some celebrity, it's, you already have an abuse problem. It's not a good problem. mix, you, you know? Quick fame, you. quick yeah. fame, and then not being able to handle it, and then the disappointment of not being able to handle it, and the rejection and the failure. It's a lot. And then, you know, people obviously go back to self-medicating, um, and if they already have a problem with addiction, it just escalates sometimes. And so, Is it fear of success or fear of failure? I think it's generally a little bit of both. I think that... It, it is definitely fear-driven, though. I think mm-hmm. most addiction problems stem from either loneliness, depression, or fear. We see a lot of that. Those are generally pretty common traits. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that is because addiction leads to a lot of those things. I don't think people generally start out that way, but isolation, loneliness, separation from family, separation from the people you care about, um, becoming more and more just about using and uh, giving up everything in your life. It's that sense of loss, isolation. And here, this guy, you know, he worked his whole life probably 
for this dream. For that one moment. Yeah, yeah. that one moment. He gets it, and then what's he going to do? And he just implodes with his substance abuse, and it's just was a sad every, thing to yeah, watch. My, my fear was that I wouldn't get any bigger. You know, my fear was I wanted right. more and more and more and more, right. and that's the other side of that, right? Well, I love that story you tell about the Beatles with John Lennon. You should... Right, John Lennon with the Beatles. Were, Paul McCartney told me the story. They were, they were sitting together, and they were going to talk about getting back together. And just the four of them, without any lawyers or anything, and they went back and forth. George was still alive, and obviously John as well. And they went around, and George was kind of wanted to do it. Paul certainly wanted to do it. Uh, and they all went around with the reasons why they should do it, why they shouldn't. Finally, at the end, John Lennon raised his hand and said, what's the point? Be more famous? And uh, I think that was the end of that conversation. Randy Spelling, you've been in the spotlight. We're not going to say why for everything, but uh, your family has been... Um, publicly dysfunctional and publicly great both on both sides of the thing. But mm -hmm. what do you think of this Anthony Riley story? I mean, here's a guy with celebrity and celebrity to be. And as Andrew pointed out correctly, here was his dream in front of him. I think it's tragic. And it's, it's one of those situations where if he's coming in with a substance abuse problem, having all of that pressure and having this be the, the, the best thing in your life, working years to get to this point, it's hard to keep it all together. I mean, I found it tremendously difficult when I was, I was shooting a reality show actually right before I got Which clean. Which one? Is that the Malibu? It was called Sons of Hollywood. Oh, Sons of Hollywood, yeah. Mm, yeah, and it, you, yeah, anyway. Um. <laughs> you, had the greatest, you had the greatest porn name ever on Malibu Shores. Uh, <laughs> Flipper Gage. <laughs> I love that. That's a good one. So go ahead. So yeah, you're shooting. He's sober now, Pat. So, he's sober now. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I didn't mean to make it about me, but but the point was when That's I was you're here, when I was shooting a reality show and I had cameras on me all the time and I had a substance abuse problem. It got exponentially worse because I felt that I I had to keep this. Uh, I had to keep it all together and I had to, to be something, but inside I was tortured and I was in turmoil, but yet I have to look like everything's okay and this is the greatest time of my life. And it, and it wasn't. I thought it was great in your book how you describe that moment where you're sitting in the, it's in the beginning, I think, actually, where you talk about, you know, your sister was famous and you see your father and your sister out and they get all this attention. You're like all of a sudden decided you wanted to go into acting. And then as soon as you got into it, you're like, oh, this is horrible. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I liked acting for a while, but I always thought it was going to give me something that I really wanted, which was self-worth and to know my place in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't. I mean, I, I made money. I got a chance to do a lot of great things, but didn't bring the, the inner world. And that's that I was identity for. formation, right? We see that a lot with addiction where people start using substances and they're longing for some sort of identity, but then the substance, they don't get the identity. And so they start using substances and then they become developmentally arrested at that age when they start using. And until they stop using and they get sober for a while and then they have to figure out their identity again. Well, I think, so. uh, bring it back to so called normal people, Andrew. Same thing, an mm -hmm. identity crisis in your family, the, you know, the younger brother or something, and you want to look like or be like your uh, older brother. Or Jimmy older Carter's sister. brother, right? Well, let's, <laughs> let's go to normal people. I said normal people. Uh, but just every, in everyday life, I think there's that pressure in a right. family situation. And if there's an yeah. a, one addict in the family, it could be you trying to be as normal as everybody else. Well, there's a lot of different situations, clearly, but that's certainly one of them. Another one that I find particularly disturbing is often the addict is the identified patient in the family. And often that's just the most sensitive person that's actually acting out the problems of the dysfunction of the entire family. So understanding that's really important when you're treating substance abuse or if you're working with someone in your own family that has substance abuse, sometimes it's important to look at the whole family system and say, hey, you know what? Mom and dad divorced. Maybe that had something to do with it. There's a lot of things going on here. There's a lot of tensions and strains and, and problems that the, you know, the actual person that's using the substances is acting out. So often I'll, I'll work with a family instead of just the individual because it's better to work with the entire family and see all the dynamics of what's going on. Um, you're uh, a life coach, Randy Spelling. What does that mean? Yes. And help, uh, right? <laughs> essentially, I help people live better lives, mm -hmm. uh, looking at patterns and things that keep cropping up that people can't get Give us an example from. Um, Not to name names, but... Oh, meaning a person? Or? Just, no, but just like give us an example. Client. Somebody will come um, to you You know, and say, a lot of people come to me because they don't feel fulfilled or, um, you know, they want to change jobs or careers. So they come because they know that they want to change, but they don't know where to start. They don't know what they want to do or where to go. So it takes some digging and excavating to get to what they really want underneath maybe uh, more money or more happiness. 
What do you tell the man or woman who clearly doesn't have a chance? Doesn't have a chance. Right, doesn't have with... the talent or the ability or the work ethic to, to move forward. You can't just keep um, saying keep trying because then... No, I don't say keep trying. I think it's important to look at what holds them back. Um, that's really what I do is, is to taking a deeper look at what's in their way, what holds them back, what parts about themselves uh, sh- are shaping their perspective and their reality. And that's what we talk about at the clean centers. By the way, our uh, treatment center number is 24-7. That means that's not the number. That's how long it's open. <laughs> 888-601-6040. And it's almost the same. I keep turning my back to one of you guys. Sorry. That's right. It's almost the same, though, when, when you deal or we deal with at this, uh, in rehab with family issues that you have to, if you have a substance abuse problem, you have to just keep hacking away of why you have that problem because if you don't find out that you know the brain that creates the problem doesn't solve the solution right and i think that you know different people have different goals for their lives i mean uh both you and i probably suffer and randy to some degree probably suffer from work addiction right work has been very important to us our careers have been important to us and other people that's not so you know other people have other things that are more important to them and so finding out what makes someone have a sense of purpose and identity obviously isn't always something around work sometimes it's around who they are as a person and what they do and what they represent. And, um, you know, so it's important to see that there's a wide varieties of different ways that people can interact and be in the world. And it's, there's no one size fits all. There's no perfect Cinderella shoe. And it's a, it's a process of life and exploring and it changes and there's different stages in life. And as you go through forming your identity and then becoming, you know, an effective adult, and then you deal with generativity or becoming older and looking back at your life and make, having a sense of worth. These are the important sort of narrative little stories that we tell ourselves in our in our mind all the time and building those successfully to having a positive sense of well-being and being effective in the world around you not just with the people that are close to you but people outside of of your direct family and your direct associates is important and people always talk about the community or the voices in your head not um Real, well, there are voices that talk to you. It's your ego talking. The ego's not real. Neither is your past, right? Your past is only uh, a memory. There's no future, so you live for the moment. How do you describe to people that the voices in their head saying, you're not good enough, you're bad enough, and this and that? Uh, you're the one who put those, not you, but you're the one who puts the voices in. By the way, it's all he's, he's responsible for every problem in America. No, but I mean. Sorry, the, everyone. The, per- right. the, the, person, the person that has the voices apology. in their heads. Uh, I'm not talking about schizophrenics. I'm talking about normal people. You wake up and they say, oh, you, your day is going to be awful. Your day is going to suck. You have to realize that you're the one who puts that voice in your head, right? We all have those voices yeah. that run in our heads. Um, and I, I do believe that they are put in there at an early age. But then, and that's why psychodynamic therapy became so popular and why looking at the, the, the mother and the father and the family nucleus, because it, from one to seven, things are really uh, sort of implemented and crystallized, and then those voices come out. So they're old, old voices, and uh, I, I work with people on changing those voices because someone may say, well, I really want this for my life. I really want to get ahead and I want to be happy and I want to, but there's voices in there saying, you don't deserve it. You're not good enough. And they're so subtle they, it, that it takes uh, a lot of self-awareness to identify the voice and then change right. A lot of, a lot of those, no parent ever raises a kid by telling you that either, right? No, I mean, uh, you know, everybody that's born and grows up is going to have problems. I mean, this idea that you're going to have a perfect life, it just doesn't For exist. For me, it's growing up. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're still working on that. <laughs> but uh, we'll work on that later, Pat. I but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, everybody has problems. Everybody has issues. The question is, how do you deal with them? How do you, what kind of problem solving skills? You know, as a therapist, you're taught that you have like a bag of tricks and they're therapeutic tricks or tools that you can use to get people to understand what's going on in their life and the real issue is to teach clients those same tools so mm-hmm. that they have not just the same things they relied on their whole life to get by but instead all these new ideas and what we find often with addiction especially in mental health when people are properly medicated or or they resolve the mental health problem and don't need medication is that what was important to them is often not important to them anymore 
So like with Randy, you talked about like being wanting to be on television and whatever, and then you had a transformation into the person you are now, giving back and you know working as a life coach and whatever. And so often people, musicians even, who wanted to be in the studio all the time and they use cocaine all the time to be in the studio, they get sober and all of a sudden they realize, you know what, I don't need to be in the studio all the time. And I certainly don't need to do all that cocaine. I can actually write at home, you know, really work on my songs and then go in and record. And so you see this transformation of, of what is important. Being in the studio all of a sudden isn't important. Writing great right. music is. But on the creative side, we've talked about this a lot. You listen to Clean Radio, by the way, and our treatment number is 888-601-6040. But we talk about this a lot, that a lot of uh, very famous musicians who are now sober, they're, what held them back from going out playing, they didn't think they could play sober again. Right. And it turns out, and I could make a list, but I don't want to out all. Well, and also, it's the whole rock and roll lifestyle, right? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And right. so they think that that's the identity of a rock star is that you have to, you know, I guess have sex and do drugs and, and play <laughs> rock and roll. But even if you're, even if you're not a rock star. Three letter word here. Wait, wait, sorry, people have sex. I understand. <laughs> even if you're not a rock star, I think one of those things where. Um, typically for drinking. You know, you go out to a bar and everyone's drinking. Now that you've stopped drinking, how do you navigate that? How do you go about being at a dinner when everyone's drinking? You know, can you still socialize again? Can you still live without that thing? Well, the answer is yes. And that's what we were talking about earlier is that you have to find, if you get sober, a new identity and right. find out that you can go to Starbucks uh, well, I think also, Andrew but also much you know, fun. with drinking, like you're but talking this about guy social on three situations. Cups of coffee, though, watch out. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. So, anyway, so but uh, drinking in social situations, like uh, what, a, what a lot of people that stop drinking find out is that after the first two drinks, they don't want to drink, even though they have this feeling that they want to drink when people start drinking. But if they can make it through everybody else drinking two drinks, then they realize how stupid people get when they drink, mm-hmm. and then they actually have this reformulation of, oh, you know what, I don't have to drink, and now there's no social pressure anymore because they're all drinking and a lot of the peer pressure about drinking is wanting to have the other people drink so they can feel comfortable but as soon as you're not drinking for a couple drinks and they get a little loaded then all of a sudden they don't care if you're drinking or not as long as you're still hanging out so you know I found that the easiest well of course everybody knew my story but I I found the easiest way when they say how come you're not drinking I just tell them look I'm an alcoholic yeah, that shuts them up pretty fast by the way (laughs) Uh, or what I usually say is if someone sends a drink over I say uh, I have to be home by Christmas so I really can't drink that uh, this time around. <laughs> How's your book doing? My book's doing well. Tell us about it. Uh, it's been out for three months. It's called Unlimiting You. And uh, like I was saying before, it is. Uh, I, I took about six of the main limitations, the, the ways in which I found that myself, my clients, uh, kept themselves limited. And... Uh, I, uh, I, I identified all of those and gave a lot of exercises, tools. And the main thing that I did in this book that I, that I was shooting for is I included stories of myself mm-hmm. and my clients because a lot of times it's hard to remember text, you know, heady things that uh, just you're not going to remember next week. But we do remember stories. Yep. And so I tried to put them in story form so people can remember them and uh, change the things they want to change. And we have copies for you guys here, and you're going to sign them later, right? What, 50 bucks a copy? Is that? <laughs> sure, only Char- 49. Char- <laughs> Here's a spelling. They, they weren't successful if, uh, for no other reason. Uh, but that's, um, but the changing part, and you, know, you and I talk about this, Andrew, all the time. That, you know, they say, what do you have to do after you get sober if you have a really awful, well, they're all awful, drug problem or alcohol problem? And you say, what you have to change is everything. But it sounds awful, but it's... I find it to be yeah. fulfilling. I mean, it's a little, I mean, it's, I think people say that because they want to give you a concept that even though it seems overwhelming, it also presents this sense that there's an opportunity that's limitless to some extent. And that's the truth, that if you get sober, you have like a second chance. And we see that a lot. And like I said, we see people make different paths and different life choices once they get sober. So, you know, this is, it's really an opportunity. And, and, and that's, I think, one of our major messages is that, you know, get sober, you know, be functional and see what happens in life. You might be really surprised. One of the things I hear the most from people who do get sober and they get over that hump of all the discomfort and, and what that's like living life that way. Then I hear, I went on a walk and I was looking at, uh, at, at flowers or, you know, I just had this, these simple moments and they had so much more appreciation for being in that moment. Even uh, Eminem, I think it was in Rolling Stone uh, when he got sober, he said the same thing. He said, I look at flowers now 
And he said, you know, I wouldn't have said this before, but he said, I look at flowers. You I have look to at wrap leaves. this, by the way. Right. Did you see? I'm starting to get into it. <laughs> and, 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 and it was true for him is he appreciated nature. He never really stopped to look at a leaf. But now that he, uh, he had more clarity, he was able to enjoy life more, much more than he ever thought he'd be able to. And I think part of that is the people that become really bad drug addicts think they're going to die or they're suicidal and they feel like they want to die. And so when they get sober and all of a sudden they get this second chance, there's this sense like, oh, wow, I get everything's brand new and everything's free. And like, you know, I might not have had this. So there's a real appreciation for life. Casey just joined us. This is the hippie show. Uh, we, sound like, we sound like three aging hippies, but right. that's really what it is. And I've talked to Eminem about, uh, about his problems, and, and that's right. You open up a new world. I think the first flower came out 116 million years ago, and there's a great book about what it must have been like for the person or animal who first saw that flower when the person, um, unless it was me. Was I still around then? 116, I, 116 million, million years ago? Years ago. Well, you I know. believe you were. Modern medical science. <laughs> but it's a lot of people, it clicks on, you know. Uh, there's a great book called This Is It, and what it is is that, this moment. And I think uh, when you get some clarity finally uh, in your head, uh, you can appreciate those things. Like, you really look good right now. Thank you. Wow. Like Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> he was looking at you but talking about Turn me. Turn to me. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's just hard for people who, not, who aren't uh, uh, in recovery or taking care of themselves to explain that to them. You know, and that's your job, sort of. To, uh, yeah, and, and all the and, wonderful people that work for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, well, yeah. <laughs> I remember that, too, is... Um, it being in, in the rooms of AA way back in the day and people saying, life gets so much better, you're going to enjoy it, it's going to be new. And I just remember feeling nauseous and frustrated thinking, whatever, you, you that's not true. And it, it is true, but you just have to get through some of the, the discomfort. Well, Jason Waller, the great you know, young actor, and um, he, he told Andrew and I that he would have these parties and all this cocaine and stuff. He said this on the air, so I'm not... Busting him. Oh, wait. He did say it on the air. He did say it yeah, on the air. Okay. Um, <laughs> he said he went in the bathroom and do tons of cocaine yeah, and come and, out and, and try to act so like so miserable and it was his party, you know? Mm. And, and people don't, you know, they think that, you know, I mean, I had a wonderful career and it's still going on, but that most of the last five years of it were misery for me because I had to pick on the spelling family and I got sick of picking on my friends and I had to pick on people that I liked and they, they, our shows, The Insider and um, Entertainment Tonight, they bled people to death for ratings. Mm -hmm. That's not an that's answer. Why, that's why Randy is, drank. Is that, <laughs> Pat's looking at me for an answer. <laughs> no, but you know what it's like when you're getting picked on all the time. I, I do, yes. I mean, it's it, it's tough. And I'll I, make you talk about it. So you can, you know where you can what go. do you want to know, Pat? But, but, I'm here. Yeah, but no, Pat, you know what? Once again, coach, once once again Pat, that's you like recognizing that it, it what you were doing and how you were acting somewhere didn't sit with your core values. It's out of alignment. You know? yeah. Something there must have been hard to do this. And still, that's what you're, and, you're and, doing for a job and doing for a living yet it probably doesn't feel good yeah i mean you're looking i mean i know you really well and you're not someone that would attack people in that kind of way no it's not your thing the only person i attack is when you and i have dinner together yeah which is we go you know, back and forth <laughs> yeah Andrew has this irritating <laughs> um, irritating thing where he has all these board games he likes to play but he's played them 50 times <laughs> and i've seen it once <laughs> and, he, and he wins every time so I'm concerned about you in that. The the my the, desire to win by the picking desire to just obscure board kill me games in all from these Africa. board games. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody's got to have their thing. <laughs> <laughs> you get to do the Olympics and I get to pick board games. Well, that's from why uh, we were playing this what was the name of that game last night? I don't even know the name of it. It's just something You think Africa. our lives are so glamorous <laughs> we were playing stupid we're board, there board playing games. Board games. <laughs> um, but um, I did that, win two for two. That's two why for two. Uh, Oh, here we go. But that's why guys like Magic Johnson and Joe Montana and all those great athletes were so great because they saw the whole picture. Right. And to be metaphorically sound here, that's what we try to teach people or tell people to do, to see the big picture in life, right? To see that at the end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train coming towards you. It's actually light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't want to live a, a better life to see things with more color and be in the moment. Do I sound like a hippie? Yes, you know, we all do. <laughs> Gosh, that's why. Uh, you just heard myself say that. And you, I was like, you what? put M and M and flowers in the same sentence. So yeah, I think. Hey, that's, but that that's, I mean, I mean, that's hippie-ish. Yeah, I don't know. But you'll remember it, right? Yeah, you will. Hippie shake. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back in a little bit. There's nothing wrong with hippies, right? <laughs> Not, absolutely. I was one. I am one yeah, now. We'll go. be back in a minute. All right.
<laughs> Don't let addiction to drugs or alcohol steal another year of your life. Clean Treatment Center provides world-class addiction assistance that also treats the underlying causes and provides vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean. Live, kind, professional help is standing by to provide immediate assistance or to simply answer questions and provide guidance. If you or someone you care about is suffering from addiction, take action now. Log on to cleantreatmentcenters.com. That's clean with a K. Uh, we're having a good time up here in Portland. We, we've been here all week, and uh, it's been great. They have a, a, a new clean center that we toured in yeah, we Portland, and we got one center. up in, yeah. and then we have one up in Long Beach, but we have one in the city, an ILP. Tell us about that. Yeah, we have an uh, outpatient program here, and it's intensive outpatient program. People can go three to five days a week um, and get therapy and work on issues regarding, regarding substance abuse and whatever other issues might be going on. Randy Spelling's so. with us, and his book is out. Uh, <laughs> Going to be competing with my book in a couple of months because mine's coming out in paperback. But we, won't, we won't mention that. But, Never uh, compete with you, Pat. No, that's Im- almost impossible. <laughs> uh, serious about it. Uh, well, we welcome all our listeners in New York City, WOR, seven, the mighty uh, uh, 710, home of the Mets, LA. We're on KABC. We probably should mention the Dodgers every now and then since our biggest audience is LA. Somebody came up to me the other day and said, How come you ever talk about the Dodgers? Well, uh, because they left uh, New York. <laughs> no, I mean, because we welcomed WOR in. Let's welcome our uh, social media uh, queen, actually, Sarah Gilbert. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How what are they saying? Oh, we can give her a round of applause. Uh, Sarah joins. It's going to be a regular on the show now. What's going on out there? Well, what is going on out there? We do have a few questions. Um, some really interesting questions, actually, about treatment. We have one from James. Mm-hmm. He asks, what can you do for a family member who went to rehab in the 80s, stopped all hard substances, mass cocaine, but today says they suffer from chronic pain. They take morphine, fentanyl, Vicodin, amnitriptyline, <laughs> along with daily marijuana. Can you do an intervention when they are convinced everything is completely legal and there is no problem? Well, first of all, call our clean center <laughs> immediately at <laughs> 888-601-6040. But yeah, I mean, that's... Not a common, but a normal problem for massive it's, substance abuse. It happens all sorts of ways. I mean, a lot of people, we, we've, there's a study that just came out showing that the amount of heroin use has increased almost actually a little bit higher than the amount of regulation of uh, synthetic opioids and pill opi- opioids like oxycodone. So, you know, we're seeing, you can see people that either start with illegal drugs or start with legal drugs and then get into illegal drugs because of cost and, and escalating tolerance, which cre- means you have to take more to stay comfortable um, in your addiction. So um, we're seeing that. But in this case, you know, where you have someone that's taking a lot of medications and with a lot of medical problems, that's a tough case to deal with. And I, I always tell people that, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, there's obviously key problems in the family that the person's expressing that they want this person to stop taking all these hard narcotics. But um, it may be true that they need them for a medical reason. And so it's not responsible for anybody to just say, hey, you know what, you're taking off fentanyl, you're taking this, it's prescribed by a doctor, you just need to stop right now. The truth of the matter is you have to find a doctor that you know that will work with you to see how much you really need to take, if anything, and then work your way off or down or into what we call baselining a client. So often we'll take a patient in and we'll put them in detox and we'll take them off of everything and see what happens. And then, But keep an eye on it. But yeah. while we're keeping them medically stable and then we'll add medications back um, if they're needed. And if they're not, then they're obviously not needed. Yeah. So it's great. And try to find the right cocktail, so to speak, for, for somebody who has Yeah, and the fortunate multiple. thing is that, you know, there's a lot of people that do have chronic pain and have real medical yeah, issues. Yeah, the key word is as, uh, key as, two prescribed. Words, as prescribed. But also, uh, sometimes it's a balance, unfortunately, within medicine between quality of life and then, um, you know, the effects of the medication. Um, so, uh, it's not often an easy thing, and that's why I encourage people really to work with their doctors. But one of the most important things, if you have a substance abuse issue or if you're dealing with really strong narcotics, in this case, over it's mostly fentanyl and whatnot, is to be honest with your doctor about usage. And one of the problems is about addiction is people start lying because that's just what you want to do. You want to get more and more. So you start lying to your doctors or all of a sudden you get two doctors or you get friends, you start adding other drugs from the outside. And that's why we see most of the uh, um, overdoses with substance abuse or polysubstance abuse related, meaning that people are taking more than one substance. You know, and the problem is that drugs work. They do. And uh, I say that uh, and mean it, but 
as prescribed, they work. I mean, you take one, let's say Oxycontin, you have a major pain problem. Uh, you take one Oxy, and you say, well, I guess two will make me feel better, right? <laughs> well, it's just like uh, people often ask me, do I believe in legalization of drugs? And the truth of the matter is I do. I think that there should be a free market and drugs should be out there. And, and that sounds crazy. But the, but the truth of the matter is, is that at the end of the day, they're out there anyway. And so criminalizing drugs is not really very effective. We know that. We see prisons are all full. We have more people in prison than any first world country. And so here we are in this mess and where people aren't getting treatment and we're spending all this money locking people up. And that just makes people worse. I mean, you want to take someone that's got a slight mental health issue and a substance abuse issue and make them worse, stick them in a box for 24 hours a day or 23 hours a day and see what comes out 10 years later. It's not going to be pretty. I Didn't they that. legalize it in Portugal? For that yeah, reason, all drugs all drugs are legal in Portugal, and actually the rates of addiction are lower than anywhere else uh, that where drugs are illegal. And Sarah so. said she got they got rid of the hard stuff. In many cases, it's all hard stuff. Sarah, what else you got? Well, this one is actually kind of along the lines of what you were just speaking about with legalization. This is from Billy. What is your recommendation to governments and police who want to test people for marijuana use while driving? Well, that's a big topic now uh, in it's this country, news, and uh, Andrew's got some good thoughts, thoughts on it, but with the easing of laws, if not eliminating them all over the country, uh, here in Oregon, I was just in Colorado last week speaking, and there, it's, as everybody knows, it's, the, it's everywhere, and it's, it's legal to smoke it. And I always wonder, do you, would you rather have a person drunk driving or a person high on um, marijuana? I don't really... but. You know, I mean, and now I mean, none of it's good. Uh, you know, uh, th there are some interesting facts about drug use and driving that people don't. The reason why I pause people. there, we used yeah. to laugh at people who'd come in. I used to when I was in rehab. They'd say I'm addicted to marijuana. We go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, uh, you know, try the, the heavy stuff, but it is a problem. But you know, there's all sorts of types of addiction. I think this is where people get confused. The idea that you have to be physically addicted to right. a drug, like a heroin addict that starts, you know, having flu-like symptoms and gets sick if they don't get their drug that they need just to become normal, versus psychological addiction. And heroin addicts that have a physical addiction also have a psychological addiction as well. So all these things are going on. So marijuana is just, uh, and if it. Gets Gets to that point where it becomes an unhealthy coping skill, then once again, it, the psychological addiction of that substance stops them from switching to a more healthy coping skill. And that's what it's all about. So, you know, you, if you know, there's some people that can smoke pot and it isn't a problem. You yeah. know, there's some people that can drink alcohol and it isn't a problem. Um, we're not talking to that But person. we're not talking about those people. Yeah, we're talking about people where these things, and like I said, most of these things don't just happen one at a time. You're drinking, you're smoking, you're, you know, doing coke or whatever. The next thing you know, you're doing it every day in some combination of right. that just to So you're at that party to have at a pattern. House, huh? yeah. <laughs> about 10, 15 years ago. Um, I wouldn't have remembered it if I was. <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, can yeah. I do one plug? We're sure, hashtagging absolutely. live Clean Radio PDX. So hashtag Clean Radio PDX. If you have any more questions, thank you. There she thank is. Thank you, Sarah. The great Sarah Gilbert. Very good. First time up. A star is born. There's another uh, story out there, uh, Andrew, we were talking about before the show. And they're talking about now having a, a marijuana breathalyzer. First of all, what would that be? Yeah, there's um, a breathalyzer. You're there's also... What? Uh, it's THC, so but there's 56 different cannabinoids in marijuana, so THC is just the most recognized and sort of thought of uh, hallucinogen that actually, actually it's not technically a hallucinogen, but um, it can have amphetamine qualities, and we're seeing that. There's so many different strains of marijuana now that you can create all sorts of effects with the drugs and the different cannabinoids in them by varying the different quantities within the drug. So, um, But it's become a problem with driving in these states where it's recreational, and obviously we don't want people loaded and driving on anything. Uh, the police haven't, in regulation, this is one of the things that I said that I was really surprised by about the legalization movement in the United States was that it's one thing to legalize everything, but it's another thing to legalize everything without having first figured out maybe what the externalities are going to be. What are the consequences going to be? And how do we deal with that from a regulatory standpoint and as a government and as a society? So driving while intoxicated on marijuana, nobody really thought about that because normally when people get pulled over smoking pot, you just bust them for the pot and then they go to jail. And the, the fact that they were driving, you charge them with reckless driving or something like that or driving under the influence with possession, right? Now you can't do that so 
they got to try and figure out what's going on. So now what they're doing is they're taking these swabs to see if you have THC in your blood or in your saliva or in your breath. They have a breathalyzer thing that, and it just all it does is says that yes, there's THC in your system, but THC stays in your system for about a year. So th- it actually Oops. gives if you use pot now, basically you're waiving any right to do process and they're allowed to now take you in and then do a blood test to see if there's an active level of THC in your blood system that's enough to cause impairment. So anybody that smokes pot that gets pulled over in Colorado now can get hauled to jail for a blood test. That's a pretty significant invasion of your rights for something that's supposedly legal. So I think we need to look back at the laws and say, okay, if it's going to be legal and we have no real way to test it in real time, we're going to have to look back and say, hey, you know what? Before they had driving under the influence and driving while intoxicated, there was something called reckless driving, and that was the dominant law. So if you got pulled over for drinking in the past, you used to go to jail for reckless driving, and the fines for reckless driving were much more severe than they were for even drinking and driving. I mean, often they just let you go. So, you know, we had Mothers Against Drunk Driving come out and have this whole reform movement and alcohol uh, uh, driving while intoxicated became a big deal. And I think we're going to see those same groups actively campaign against other substances. As with most of the politicians, when they get involved in the drug wars, uh, they fail. You know, uh, Richard Nixon began the war on drugs, which is yeah. still going on. It's worse. And uh, you know, all these laws in these states that legalize it, you made the point, they didn't think it out. I mean, they didn't, first of all, oh, now we have all this money coming in, and the yeah. banks won't take it. You know, and there's millions of dollars floating around, and they don't know yeah. if they have to launder the money. So it creates a sort of an inner mafia within people that were they had a little grocery store. It's not going to make a million. Well, a lot of, of that's still because the federal government hasn't legalized marijuana. Right. So you didn't got, figure that out either. Yeah, they well. Uh, it, go ahead. You'll it's actually fine. ironically, it's how America works. We have 50 states. It's one of the things that makes America actually a great country from a political standpoint. We have this great social experiment. So we have 50 states in America. Each state gets to create their own laws. Now, the federal government actually has uh, the right to supersede any state law, but. At the same point, and then we saw this actually happen originally under Carter when he said, you know what, if you don't want to lower the speed limit in every state to right. 55 miles per hour, then guess what? You're not going to get any federal highway funds. So there's always been fights between the federal government and the state. But what's nice about this idea that the states can create their own laws and then experiment with them is that then the federal government can look back at all the 50 states' different laws and say, you know what, that one doesn't work, that one doesn't work, but what they're doing here in Oregon, oh, that's really interesting. And we can model that out and make it federal law and then have it apply to all the right. states. And that's the problem with abortion laws, right? Because uh, state by well, state... They, that's they, a whole other show. I know, but <laughs> I'm just trying to put another thing in context of it. That's yeah, the, the federal it. government can enforce that all states have to offer abortion. But now we're seeing situations where states make it so it's basically impossible to get an abortion even though it's legal. So they shut down clinics. They you know, they do other things and measures. So. Randy Spelling, what do you make of the story that they're going to have TH, uh, drugged driving as opposed to drunk driving? Um, I think I would be for it. I mean, I have uh, two daughters, and by the time they're driving, I, I would want something implemented so... Uh, People could be tested on the road, so people aren't driving loaded. But I wonder how, what would be the, I guess, the way police would stop them is if erratic driving, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think reckless way. driving is really the issue. Yeah. You know, it's like you're not going to ever be able to test. And we don't even test for all substances. For example, you can take a ton of Valium and be all over the road. And without doing a blood test, they don't know what's going on. Right. And often they don't test for these substances. And Randy and I were back in the green room um, and we were talking about it. He was like, you know, what are the new substances <laughs> of the day? I'm like, well, there's so many. I don't even know because there's new chemicals coming out every day from China and India and all these other countries. They're manufacturing synthetic drugs. And they're all legal. And in in Europe, when I was there a little while ago, they talk, there's a huge movement of legal drugs, which are basically drugs that are synthesized by different you know companies in all these countries, and they import them into our country. You know, on this driving thing, I've, I've, back in the '80s, I was with a. It's in my book. I'm, I can't remember where it is in the book, or if it stayed in there. But anyway, a very very famous rock star, and we got completely hammered, smashed coked everything okay and so we were driving very carefully to get back to the hotel he was driving and we got picked up oh you know the sirens well, this is going to be in the newspapers and that and the policeman or the highway patrolman said do you realize how fast you guys are going and my friend said uh, uh, i'm sorry we're going too fast he goes no you're going 20 miles an hour on the freeway <laughs> you're being a little too right. careful uh which is which is the problem there uh is your book who is your book who do you want to read your book 
I well, want, everybody, of course, but I mean, <laughs> is it targeted want, to... Uh, it, it's, I would say it's targeted to uh, anyone who really wants a change in their life and feels that they need perspective on looking at themselves differently, mm-hmm. looking at their lives and themselves in a different way. Did to you move get forward. an experience of looking at your own life when you wrote it? Because when I was writing oh, my absolutely. book, I'm like, oh my God. It was a, a pain and pleasure sort of thing. I, I felt like I was ripping my hair out. And then um, as I was writing these things, then I would, I would see how my life, where I went, what happened in it. And I thought, okay, I, I've, I've come pretty far. But then there would be something when I was giving exercises that I... Um, I thought you were going to say I was giving ecstasy. But no. <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing exercise, when I was writing the exercises, sure enough, that day, I, something would happen with my wife or my family, and I would have to live that thing that I was writing about and say, oh, Randy, you cannot be a hypocrite. You just wrote about this. So I would be faced to having to grow through uh, a situation because mm-hmm. I was writing about it. Well, I think, uh, let me just say that that's one of the problems I think that a lot of people have is that it's this extreme thinking that either you're perfect or you're terrible, right? It's this black and white sort of thing. And we see that a lot in America, right? Either you're a superstar or you're nobody. Right. You're the best hitter in the, in the National Baseball League or you're nobody. And that's just not the way the world works. And that's not how things happen. Everybody has faults and failures constantly. And the question is, like I said earlier, is not do you have problems? Are there things that are wrong with you? Or do you make mistakes? The question is, what tools do you have to deal with it? And how do you get through it? And that's what your books are great about. These exercises you talk about, you're actually creating problem-solving devices for your own problems, which yes. is pretty cool. And then you have to do the work. That's like the old uh, joke is that uh, the guy who says a prayer and does a sign of the cross before he goes to bat hits a home run three times in a row. And the guy said to the priest, this prayer thing must work, huh? He goes, yeah, if you can hit. <laughs> and you know, that's why I do, do the work. And you know, uh, Andrew uh, has allowed me to, to not be a counselor because I'm not one, but to have a group uh, over at the West Hollywood Center. And I tell these people uh, all the time, and I hope you agree with me, that writing stuff down, like we talked about writing a book, is kind of important in your recovery. Mm-hmm. Or even in your normal life, if you can put it on paper and actually look at it at the mm-hmm. end of the day right. and see it, once it's on paper you see what's been going on and where it's taken you or talk it into Siri I think is what they do now no <laughs> <laughs> you can ask by the way you can ask Siri oh wait wait we're in the Microsoft lounge I shouldn't have said that <laughs> that's right. I don't, <laughs> believe me uh, it's, uh, you can ask uh, your smartphone right uh, <laughs> where can I buy heroin and uh, and it'll send you to uh, rehabs it'll send you to a, a, a thing on so somebody thought of that they won't wow. send you. Yeah, I didn't try that one. And, no, I didn't try that one. Either. <laughs> well, I didn't either, but I'm sure people have. You know, yeah. uh, you listen to Clean Radio. You can find us at Facebook.com/slash Clean Radio, CleanRadio.com, 24/7, and we do Clean Weekly. Sometimes it's Clean Monthly, and we do the updates on recovery of uh, what's going on in the world, and we do those once a week or sometimes only once a month. But they're there at Clean Radio at Clean CEO is Andrews. Really horrifying. Do you really want me to change it? I can if you want. I have 160 something followers. No, it's fine. All right. So you don't filter any of them out, right? I no, was... I think half of them are from like Asia. <laughs> that's what's wrong with the Asians? Nothing, but okay. You know, but I mean, different time zones. No, it's not you know, it's <laughs> different time zones. Not for you. You're up all the time. That's true. Do we have a question from the audience? Yeah, we do. Andrew. Yes. I'm curious about the story of Clean, like the who, what, when, where, how, why did it start? How did it get from there to here, and where is it going after this? Oh, Pick up wow. your check when you yeah. go on the way out. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, Clean started six years ago. It's actually my second mental health related company. My first was Paradigm Health Systems, which I started when I was only 24. Um, and I had gotten a master's in social work. And then I started with two psychiatrists. But Clean started because uh, I was originally going to go back into acute care psychiatric uh, field. And then I looked at what was going on with reimbursement and lengths of stay. And in psychiatric hospitals, we get a lot of people with substance abuse. In fact, I would say almost everybody that goes comes into an acute care psychiatric facility has some level of substance abuse. So is looking at that, I all of a sudden discovered and was asked to run uh, another rehab, which I won't mention. But um, So I became CEO of this rehab for a little while. And um, I found out that, that, wow, this is amazing. I can actually get 30, 60-day lengths of stay from insurance companies. Um, and instead of just detoxing people or adjusting their medication – 
And by the way, the average length of stay now in acute care psychiatric hospital is four to eight days. And we're talking about people with schizophrenia and substance abuse. So it's just not responsible, in my opinion, to treat people in these environments. You can't, you know, how can you possibly treat somebody for schizophrenia and substance abuse in four days? You can't. And I would argue all the time with clinicians that they're bringing up family issues and all this stuff, and you're only going to see the person for four days. So my thing was, how do I create within the regulations and within what's going on in our country, um, a company and a treatment center and a set of treatment centers that can get much more time with clients. So for, for now, it's not just about uh, getting 30 to 60 days in a rehab. For me, it's about how do we extend what we call the continuum of care to every level that we possibly can from early intervention. I'm just starting a harm reduction group in California where we're actually taking people that are actively using and talking to them about whether they want to keep using or not and then creating social contracts with them and saying, okay, your drug use and your alcohol use is at this and you know, if you drink only five drinks a week, then we're going to say, okay, you can monitor your own, regulate your own drinking and we won't put you into treatment. But if you don't, you're going to sign this contract and you're going to agree to go into residential treatment and going to an abstinence-based program. So what that does is it allows me early on, the people that are resistant to any sort of treatment, to actually join with them as a therapist and say, hey, you know, this is a problem. Here are the problems. Let's outline them so you really know what they are. Let's get past denial and all this stuff and, and start looking at the problem for what it really is. And the vast majority of people that have a substance abuse problem will eventually go towards abstinence. Um, and then on the farther end, we're looking at long-term monitoring and things like that. So it's, just a, it's a really interesting company that has a lot of vehicles that will create more and more treatment on a longer and longer continuum of care. Another question or no? That's good enough. Thank you. All right. So we'll just stand there and have a mic in front of you and we'll wait for it. But I think, okay. you just know. Just one other thing I just want to mention is we just were launching our nonprofit this, uh, this month. I was going to get into that. We yeah. have a clean cafe. We have a truck. Uh, which is a beautiful truck. You can go on clean. Uh, is it on cleancafe.com? Clean? Oh, we have a but, website for that already? Yeah, yeah we do. Not for you, but for Websites for our dogs. <laughs> uh, but no, or you can find it on Clean Center. My dog does have more friends than I do on Facebook. What does that mean? Sophie, well, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what it means after this okay, show. Okay, all right. All right. Um, <laughs> but the Clean Cafe, behind that, we're going to help train people, offer job opportunities. You'll see the truck around LA yeah, and other Yeah, one of the things that, that I've found is that, you know, a lot of people that get into substance abuse problems or have mental health histories or both, a lot of them will end up with felonies and they're unable to get employment. So, or they're undertrained or underqualified. So, I've been trying to figure out a way to create a company that basically just hires people that are in recovery and then they train each other and then eventually we hope to have multiple trucks in every city. Right. And so um, people that make it through our process and treatment and then get the job training eventually will have the right to franchise and own a truck and we're selling snacks and coffee and juice and stuff out of these trucks. And we, uh, the first one we built is beautiful and um, Lydia actually helped with it, my wife a little bit. And uh, um, it's been on the street. Helped with it? Well, she did most of it. Okay. okay. Thank you. I You're welcome, so. Lydia. Um, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't want to take any credit from her. No, anyway, but uh, so anyway, but it's, we've just been parking on the street doing photo shoots right. to get it, you know, start getting some pull up publicity out and the reality is that people are just coming up constantly so it, and it's a great way for us to interface with the community and have people present and people have been through our centers and people that know about addiction can be there so if you see one and you have a question you can not just get coffee you can go up there and talk to people about how to get help and you will see this truck outside my home for my Super Bowl party and uh, lastly all the profits go to helping people that don't have money yeah, for it's treatment. a non-profit yeah right. so it, we put all these people into treatment that can't afford it Randy Spelling how do people reach you uh, my website, randyspelling.com. Oh, I hate you. How'd you get your real name? <laughs> I had to pay for it. I had oh, to pay see? for my own name. Yeah, it, yeah, I, yeah. I can't get my real name. You know how much I played really? for clean CEO? Nothing. Zero. Because yeah. <laughs> that's why it's, by the way, that's why it's clean with a K. <laughs> <laughs> I, I changed my name I to couldn't Pat, Proctor P A T T. Yeah. Then I could uh, probably get my real name. You but. could probably do that legally. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Did we have a legal name change for me? I could. Oh, that's for another show. <laughs> so, that's right. uh, so, Randy, thank you for coming. When when people come to you, what's what do you want them to learn quickly as a life coach? Uh, I, I I want them to learn that they can do the things that are in their heart. It might not be the exact thing like you were talking about, but they can have a life that is worth meaning and find purpose and uh, learn to love themselves in their past. Yeah. Love their idiosyncrasies. And if you're out there thinking, well, that's impossible, it's not. I mean, it happened to me. 
Yeah, I also think that, you know, even if you don't know what's going on, check it out. You know, like a lot of people, they're using a lot of substances or maybe they think they have a mental health problem they don't know. And there's been a lot of stigma and a lot of problems with people getting help. And a lot of people go to their general practitioner for these things. And I generally don't suggest that. You know, g- general practitioners often, they're really busy. They're, they're going to shuffle you out of there in 15 minutes and they're probably going to give you a script. So, because everybody thinks they don't get their money's it's worth as a doctor out, unless yeah. they get a prescription. Right. In fact, a lot of doctors, I think this should be made illegal, but a lot of doctors now are doing this thing where they'll write a prescription for you, but then until you pay at the front, they won't give it to you. So, it's a way they're using collections. So, they're using scripts to min- get collections out of patients. And so. I said, it's better to admit or realize or know that you have a problem mm-hmm. and be in some sort of recovery program or getting help instead of sitting at a, uh, a bar buying crack on the street saying, I wonder if I have a problem. The other it's thing is it doesn't, it, does, it, it doesn't start by stopping. You start by thinking about it and exploring the possibilities, right? So that's the key is like, you don't have to think that, oh, okay, I got this substance problem and tomorrow I got to stop using. No, tomorrow you just need to start thinking about it and talk to someone about it because there's ways to get through the process of addiction and all the trouble and chaos that's happened in your life without actually having to go cold turkey or do it on your own or have it happen right away. There's a process to these things that, you know, that used to be that everybody would have to detox and they make it really hard on them. My goal is to make detox easy. And so people relapse, they don't stay out there, but they say, hey, you know what? I can go back to clean and I can get sober again and shorten relapses. Yeah. And one size doesn't fit all. I mean, that's also true. And you have to, uh, uh, make a, a, a program that's just not generic. It has to be uh, per patient. Randy, thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks again. for having me, you guys. Funny. Beard looks good. <laughs> Thank you. Beard looks good. And the whole point of everything, uh, Andrew, just to close it out, is that, you know, and you, you mentioned kind of the consequences are a big deal, too. If, you can, if you're starting to have consequences somewhere, you're in trouble. By yeah. that, I mean drunk and, driving and... and getting bar fights and that sort of thing. You know, people that have a substance abuse problem know that they have a substance abuse problem, even if they don't really identify it as that. They know they have this problem. They know that they're using substances. They know they're getting into problems. And at some point, you know, it gets to be too much. And my goal is to get people to get sober or start moderating their drinking and drug use before it becomes a problem. But often that isn't possible because there is a disease concept for many people and it just, they drink and use and it's off to the races. I want to thank everybody in Portland for uh, coming out today and being so nice to us this week. It's Clean Radio. I'm Pat O'Brien. He's Andrew Spanswick. We'll be back next week. Remember, live for the moment because that's all you got. We'll see you next week. Don't let addiction to drugs or alcohol steal another year of your life. Clean Treatment Center provides world-class addiction assistance that also treats the underlying causes and provides vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean. Live, kind, professional help is standing by to provide immediate assistance or to simply answer questions and provide guidance. If you or someone you care about is suffering from addiction, take action now. Log on to cleantreatmentcenters.com. That's clean with a K.